Ecco, David questa sera ci parla dalla sua casa, vero David? Uh, you are speaking from your home, David, no? Yes. Yes. Che, che, che è ai piedi delle montagne rocciose del New Mexico. Which is on the, uh, uh, on the feet of the uh, uh, mount, Rocky Mountains, yeah, in New Mexico, yes. in South uh, yes. USA. Quindi grazie David di essere, di essere con noi questa sera e ti lasciamo la parola. Thank you very much David to be with us tonight and now up to you. Ah, thank you, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be here. This is a grand experiment to see if uh, we can do this using this technology that all of us and all of you have been uh, uh, engaging through this uh, strange time of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but can we cross languages? Um, uh, let's see. It's ah. a, a great experiment to use this strange new magic in yeah. this way. Mm. Um, and maybe I will um, just walk outside onto my porch for a moment so you can see where i am located to get a little let's see um this is because uh i feel that when we are using technologies like zoom we need to uh recognize that um it is not just that we connect with each other as humans online uh but actually and truly it is also our places uh our different ecosystems or bioregions that are meeting here through this technology so this place which is the upper rio grande valley um uh is actually uh meeting through me your place Remo there in near Canterbury in uh, England is meeting uh, the places where each of you are situated in Italy um, uh, or wherever you are, are, are logging. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, the, the technology and the internet, uh, we, it can bring us all to in, into a exclusively human interaction and yeah. this is the problem mm. uh, anyway hello hello ciao from new mexico uh i uh, i will introduce myself uh a little bit so i'm david and i um i Is am Lucendo? lui è david as rosella said i am a cultural ecologist and a geophilosopher. Yeah. Geophilosopher, that is, I uh, work, uh, I create uh, the ways of thinking, uh, ways to think, ways to speak, under the influence of the more than human earth. Mm. See, um, as an ecologist, I am, and cultural ecology combines it's sort of combining anthropology and ecology. Yeah. Um, so what I am uh, most known for is uh, uh, my work on the ecology of perception, or what we could call the ecology of sensory experience. Yeah. By the ecology of sensory experience, I mean the way that the activity of our eyes of our ears, of our nostrils, uh, functions uh, to bind our separate nervous systems into the encompassing ecosystem. Mm. So that uh, perception, sensory perception, acts like a kind of glue that connects or binds our individual nervous system to the wider ecosystem. Uh, I want to say, that I am also uh, uh, known 
very much for my work on the ecology of language. That is how what we say so profoundly influences what we see or what we okay. hear. It even, the ways we speak influence what we um, smell of the world around or taste, you know, of, of the earth. It's right. so affected by ways of speaking. So I am convinced that there are ways of speaking that many of us have uh, inherited by being born at this time in this civilization, ways of speaking that, um, that actually inhibit or frustrate the spontaneous uh, reciprocity between our animal body and the animate earth around yes. us. The but, I, but I'm just as convinced that there are other ways of speaking, ways of wielding our words or putting words together that can open and encourage and enhance this instinctive rapport between mm. our animal senses and the sensuous earth. Mm. Yes. So there, that, that is enough of an introduction. It, 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 it takes us a very long time to say, <laughs> to say a very simple thing. Uh, so um, maybe you can ask uh, a question or two. Um, yeah. That will um, yeah. Yeah. make me... Uh, Rosella is uh, uh, asking you that uh, in your work uh, um, it's a lot uh, uh, about the oral culture of traditional indigenous people and uh, uh, they had a great influence on your way of thinking and writing and she's asking you what is the contrast between the oral tradition and our civilized literate culture. Ah, this is a, a big uh, question, very central to, to my work, because I noticed um, that when we speak of indigenous cultures, uh, cultures of place, cultures that have lived in some kind of uh, reciprocity with their surrounding landscapes for centuries, even for millennia, and sometimes for multiple millennia, um, have lived in a way that allows the land itself to flourish as well as the people within the land to flourish. I noticed that these are almost always oral cultures or traditionally oral cultures, cultures that um, developed and thrived in the absence of any formal, formalized writing system. And so I began to ask, what is it that writing, formal writing uh, literacy, what is it that writing does to our senses? and to our sensory experience of the earth around us. And I ask, what is it that writing does to our experience of language and linguistic meaning? Yes, so I will mention just a few, in, in the simplest way I can, a few of these um, findings uh, from my research. Uh, one, uh, there are so many uh, things that became clear. Uh, one of the most striking is that um, different uh, writing systems affect our senses in different ways. The alphabet, this phonetic writing system that most of us have grown up using, mm. is very interesting because the written letters of the alphabet just refer us back to our own face. That is, I see the letter B and I go B. I see the letter C, I go K. Uh, the letters uh, 
just uh, refer to sounds made by the human voice, mm -hmm. while a more uh, pictorially derived writing system like the ideographic script of China mm -hmm. um, or the hieroglyphic script of the Mayan people. Oh. In these uh, writing systems, you have letters or characters that are derived from uh, their stylized images of um, sunrise, sunset, mm -hmm. storm cloud and rain, animal forms. Mm -hmm. So the reader, when he or she is reading such a script, is continually reminded of language's link to the more than human landscape, that is to a world that still speaks. Everything speaks, the wind, the rivers, the mountains, the other animals. But with an alphabet, the letters just reflect us back to ourselves, to b, to k, to m. I see the letter and I make the sound that is the written letters begin to act as mirrors, reflecting the human back upon itself. So here is the, the interesting thing that it is only when the alphabet comes into a previously oral culture, usually carried by uh, missionaries, bringing the Bible and wanting to teach people the ABCs so they can, Norman. but it's only when people start to read and sometimes to write with the alphabet that, that they begin to think of language, that the culture begins to think of language as an exclusively human property. Sí, and, the rest, and the rest of the land begins to fall mute. It no longer speaks. Yeah. So I say just a few more things in relation I'm for our indigenous ancestors and for indigenous traditionally oral cultures throughout the earth. Okay. These indigenous cultures are very different from one another, mm. wildly different, very strange, but there are a few commonalities. I mentioned two. One is common to oral cultures is their experience that everything is alive or potentially alive, not just humans and other animals, but also, of course, plants, trees, whole forests, but not just animals and plants, but also the rocks and the, the, the rivers and the mountains and the winds and the weather powers, all are alive. Also human artifacts, buildings are alive. Tools have their life. Um, and the second commonality common to all traditionally oral indigenous peoples yeah. is that for them, everything speaks. But most things do not speak in words, but they, but they speak like uh, cricket uh, rhythms, um, the song of birds, but also the splashing speech of the waves upon the rocks or the uh, sigh of the wind through the branches. This too is a kind of voice. It carries meaning. So everything has the power of meaningful speech. But with the arrival of formal writing systems, all of this falls silent. So uh, with the arrival of formal writing systems, yeah. the land begins to, all of these voices fall silent. They are no longer speaking meaningfully, but it just becomes background sounds. So finally, I just, I then jump from this to say, uh, in a, and to say something very, very basic, um, as a difference between oral cultures and their experience of the more than human earth, and literate culture, and alphabetic culture, and our experience of nature.
Um, and this is just a shorthand, a very brief way of saying something. I apologize because because of translation, we need to be very simple and, and keep it brief. Mm. But, but what follows from what I just laid out, that all of the creativity, the uh, fluid, um, uh, imaginative richness mm. that we associate with the mind, mm. all of that qualitative and emotional richness and uh, fluidity that we associate with the mind and we feel is inside us, inside our head. Mm. Uh, for oral indigenous cultures, um, all of these psychological uh, qualities um, are indeed, yes, they are interior when they, they would agree there is an interiority. Mm -hmm. But the reason for the interiority is not because it is inside us, but because we are inside it, because mm -hmm. we humans are bodily inside the psyche, mm. along with all the other animals, mm. the My bodies pet. of the trees, of the clouds, we live inside a psyche that is not ours, but is Earth's. Wow. So um, maybe this is the most important aspect to bring out for, for, for this community, uh, that, that uh, our primordial indigenous uh, experience of the world around us is, is most, um, uh, until it is interrupted by technology, even the technology of the book and of the page of the book, that our immediate experience is of being bodily uh, immersed inside uh, inside the mind, inside the psyche, inside the soul, which yeah. is not ours, but is the world's. But we are inside this, along with all of the other animals and the plants and the clouds and the buildings and the rivers, See, everything, everything that has a body. Mm. So there is a sense of being immersed, enveloped, in, in intelligence. Quindi uh, abbiamo la sensazione di essere immersi e avviluppati da un'intelligenza. That is resonating so much, but so much with what are, uh, are suggesting also in the biodynamic. Very, very much. It's so, it's so in, in tune with what uh, you are saying. Ah, and here is maybe one last thing that uh, is useful to say or very interesting in relation to this because uh, to suggest as I am saying that our um, that this experience is of being immersed in a common uh, sentience or intelligence or psyche that is not ours but is is the earth's it might sound that I am saying ah so there is a great unity, there is a kind of oneness, mm. a wholeness, really? unity. But no, that is not at, at all what, what I am saying is, is, uh, is, is really about radical multiplicity and radical pluralism. Because if I and the, uh, the raven and the uh, oak tree are all immersed within the same, uh, a common psyche, but each of us experiences this intelligence or this psyche according to the, uh, 
to the senses that our body uh, has, that is, we each experience it from our own unique organism or, uh, or body. And because the raven's body is very different from my body, its experience of this mind or psyche is as different from mine as its body is different from mine. Hmm. And the aspen tree grove or the grove of oak trees is very different from both the raven and from my body. But these trees with their roots and their leaves uh, drinking the sunlight are also participant in mind, in, 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 in the vast psyche, but they experience it through their corpus, through their flesh, which is also very different from ours. So each being is, is uh, experiencing this psyche or mind in its own manner, just as you, as your body is different from my body. So your experience of this common sentience is richly different from mine. Mm -hmm. So finally, then, we could, uh, it, it may sound like when I am speaking of this psyche or intelligence, that I am speaking of uh, something very abstract. But it's important to recognize that for our indigenous uh, uh, allies and for our indigenous ancestors, this uh, psyche uh, was not at all uh, abstract. It was very uh, palpable. You could feel it because, yes, it was invisible, but it was not intangible. You have probably noticed that um, that the uh, that the word uh, that well in English our word spirit spirit originates uh, in the word spiritus, which originally means a breath or a gust of wind, just like uh, the Greek. Uh, psyche, from which we get psychology and psychiatry, La. originally means a breath or a gust of wind in oh. ancient Greece. Or just like uh, the Latin word for the soul, anima, oh. derives from an older Greek word, anemos, which yeah. means the wind. Even such a scientifically respectable word as atmosphere uh, shows or displays its uh, relation to the Sanskrit word atman, which yeah. means soul. Because for oral peoples, the soul or the psyche or the spirit is, yeah. is, is nothing other than the air. It's yeah. nothing yeah. Other than yeah. atmosphere, which is a very mysterious, incredibly enigmatic and magical uh, element. And for oral peoples, language yeah. is not something you can look at on the page or on the screen but it is speaking, it is speech, it's what I am doing just now. And so it was uh, recognized that speech is, not, is nothing other than shaped breath. You may have noticed that, that you are only able to speak by inhaling some of this invisible air, this invisible medium, Wind. and then as you breathe out, you, you, you shape the air with your teeth and your tongue and your palate, and you let the, the air vibrate a couple folds in your throat, mm -hmm. and you sound your words into the world. 
maybe you have noticed or maybe not, that we only speak on the out breath. We never yeah. speak on the in breath because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound good. It's very hard to speak. And you're oh. So it is assumed by all our oral ancestors that it is the breath that is carrying our words out into the world, carrying my words to your ears, India. carrying my words to my ears. So for oral cultures, the air is the medium of meaning. The air is the, is the medium where all our ancestors' voices still linger. It is the place of the spirits. It is the very mysterious body of the mind. So we live immersed in meaning. But also the oak tree lives immersed in meaning. So I think that there is something of this cosmology, this way of feeling the world that uh, is needing to return. Because finally, we could say that climate change is the simple consequence of forgetting the intelligence, the sentience, the sacredness of the air and treating the atmosphere just as, as a convenient dump site or a sewer for all of the toxic effluence of our industry. Do you want uh, another question before the break, little break? No, we, no. we don't have so much time. So I'm, I think um, if you want to take a little break, let's take it now and then we open to any other questions from- Okay. Perfect, perfect. Okay, then uh, we will uh, have a three, four, five minutes, not more than five minute break. We will come back. Yeah? Tell I me. would say, let's keep it, let's keep it short. It's, it's, let's say four minutes tops. Okay, so <laughs> not five minutes, four minutes break. And then we come back and uh, David will answer uh, the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Allora. Okay. Hey. Okay. okay. I feel like um, I'm just speaking to you now, but I feel like we 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 said many rich things. Thanks. In a very so. short, uh, abbreviated manner, but uh, yeah. there's yeah. a lot to. I enjoyed it very much. It's, it seemed as also the the people uh, enjoyed it very much. Great. So. so um would you like to answer some question yeah ah, it's a, um, a very nice uh, question about children so uh it's asking about education in the um, very early uh, time uh he, he imagined that the children, uh, they still have this particular uh, sensorial connection uh, with something more than human. And uh, he's asking uh, to, to, uh, to grow, to go to school, etc. cetera, mean uh, uh, really uh, losing this connection, becoming adult, mean really losing this connection which children still have as think 12. Yes, I mean, uh, for, for several centuries now, but especially for the last hundred years, uh, to go to school has meant to break this uh, sensorial kinship, oh. uh, especially as you learn to read and to write with the alphabet because that initiates you 
into the world that the adults all inhabit, which is yeah. rational and uh, not so filled with magic and wonder. Okay. I think it's very important to recognize that, uh, that this animistic sensibility is, uh, is not very developed in the child. It is just a basic instinct or empathy. For instance, uh, my daughter, when she was uh, very young, um, had uh, opened a very close relation with the, one of the apple trees in mm -hmm. our backyard. Okay. And so she felt the apple tree very much as a kind of person like her. And so she would speak to it like as, as if it was like a, a, a human being. And it had the same kind of feelings that she had the same kind of uh, emotions and yeah. sensations for her. Okay. And education at school often just cuts this uh, affinity at that point where it has not been able to uh, develop through uh, more and more subtle um, uh, uh, phases. Sure. But if we are careful not to cut it, but to keep this, this instinctive uh, affinity alive, then it begins to mature. So as my daughter began to learn more about the world also of trees, she also, it, it slowly became apparent to her that this tree was not so much like her because it could not move and walk like she, but was rooted in one place. And so she began to see the apple tree as someone very different, but just as real and intelligent as she, but with a very different style of awareness. Mm -hmm. And then as she grew older, she began to learn uh, even about photosynthesis. Hmm. And she began to understand that, that, that the tree is, is drinking water through its roots. And she would try to feel what that felt like with her own toes, just to be slurping up the water. Into why, and it is sipping water into, through its feet while its leaves are drinking the sunlight and overhead and taking it in. For, for photosynthesis. So at every stage of her development, she was coming to a richer sense of how different the tree's experience was from her experience. Hmm. So now as, as an adult, well, she is now 19, uh, she has an amazing uh, feel for what it is like to think like a mountain or to uh -oh. think like a river. But this only becomes possible when one is mature. And if, if that oh, instinctive childlike affinity is not cut or aborted at six, seven years of age, but is allowed to deepen and complexify, it becomes a much richer, uh, more mature, deeply ethical relation to a world of differences. And so it's not just childhood that uh, we need to value, but at every phase and stage of development and to yeah. recognize the importance of having a mature adult sense of animism. And then the deep importance of elders and elderhood, which brings a kind of wisdom into this a way of feeling. How can we become indigenous again? Mm -hmm. It's an important question, but I will just say one, if you are 
born of this earth, you That's are right. already indigenous. That's so right. in many ways, it is just a matter of waking up to what is already the case and making room in your, in your uh, experience, uh, giving time and space to just feeling what is already happening and making space in your language, in your ways of speaking, to find ways of speaking that don't uh, violate this modality of experience. Mm. But for instance, taking care not to ever speak of the things around you, even the things in your home, the, the chairs, the table, mm -hmm. as just objects. Okay. but recognizing, allowing that they have their own mystery. Each, each thing, a stone, a gust of wind, your house has its uh, dynamism and its open-ended uh, mystery. This is just a very simple practice uh, that you will find if you begin speaking this way, that you start noticing many more subtle subtleties in the colors of things, the textures of the things you touch, the qualities of the sensuous world around you will become much more uh, uh, real to you and more intimate if you just stop defining the things as inanimate objects. So, um, I mean, that's just one, uh, one clue of, of so many things that one could say as an answer. But in relation to that, I would just say, for me, a big practice is um, exploring ways of speaking, uh, not as speaking, not as a disembodied mind that lives inside my skull, but ways of speaking as a full-bodied animal. Can we speak as, as full-bodied creatures to other, in a way that makes whoever is listening to us and speaking with us begin to feel themselves as a full-bodied animal, mm. human animal. Yeah. But in an animal, nonetheless, this means not using words that feel to you so abstract and uh, uh, disembodied, but words that have uh, that have a feel that make your skin uh, tingle or that make your um, heart begin to beat faster. Yeah. It means that today we all have to be poets, but not writing poetry for, you know, poems to go in poetry anthologies and books, but poetry simply as speaking beautifully, speaking as a body to other bodies, not right. speaking as a mind to other minds, not, not, not speaking as a mind to other minds, hmm. but as, as a full-bodied, uh, sentience okay. to other full-bodied animals. You want to have one more or, yeah? Sure. Can I take one more? I know some people maybe have to leave, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, and before I take this, just to say, if you would mention that if people are interested in uh, any of these uh, ideas, these little edges of ideas that we have touched on here, yeah. Um, that they should look for um, uh, one uh, or the other of my my books, the spell of yeah. the scent, becoming yeah. animal. Um, yeah. And it's very strange, though, that, that they are translated in many languages. The spell is in twelve or thirteen, fourteen languages, but neither are translated in Italian. Uh, no, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I invite also many editor, four or five editor. I don't know if they are here with us, but <laughs> well, exactly. You have Becoming Animal with you? Uh, nearby, I just grab it. 
Becoming animal. Becoming or, animal. And questo. That's uh, becoming animal, and this is the skull of the Finito. century. I'm very surprised that they are not translated in the Italian yet, because that is one of the places I think that would be the most yeah, uh, I think so too. ready to work. Really? Luca is asking, uh, uh, he really likes uh, the webinar, and uh, he said, uh, uh, do you think that maybe the language, this symbolic word in which we are uh, totally embedded uh, from our birth, uh, could be at the same time uh, a gift, but at the same time a, a bless, a, 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 come si dice ferita? Hurt, a hurt. A hurt? A wound. A wound, a wound. Oh, this is very difficult to translate. <laughs> but the fact that, but the fact that uh, uh, we are immersed from birth uh, 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 or, uh, with this gift and with this uh, wound, of uh, uh, language, and these things uh, um, uh, characterize in, in a special manner our relationship with the with the things of the world. Uh, since uh, we are uh, able to uh, uh, name the, the things of the world, uh, giving them uh, uh, a name which most of the, the time doesn't. Uh, um, correspond to the to the things. I don't mm. know if it's clear. Ah, it's a it's a good and it's a beautiful question. Yeah. Uh, but for me and for this way of uh, experience and thinking that I am uh, opening a little bit here, uh, uh, I do not uh, think. Uh, that this is true because I have come to believe that the real wound, which in some ways is a beautiful wound, okay. comes only with writing. We because prior to the written word, okay. we never uh, uh, thought of words as something that should correspond to the things. Instead, for our oral ancestors, uh, words were a way of speaking to things and listening for the reply of the things. And many of our words were taught to us by the things themselves. That is, Spoke in, spoken language was a way of bridging the, the distance between oneself and another being. Okay. Like when we speak to uh, a person nearby and we say to them, I love you. Present. Or we say, who are you? Um, this is... Uh, this is a much more basic use of language, and it is the, the, the way our indigenous ancestors all understood language as something that is born in a call and response to a speaking world. Mm -hmm. And so we were using language all the time to invoke mm -hmm. and to bless Paper. and to praise the world. Yeah. It is only when we start writing our words down that we can begin to think of words as labels for things. Yeah. You know what I mean by label? So that I see the word uh, uh, tree and it's, it's a label for that thing. So, and it is only then that we begin to think of language as a representation of the world, or to think of words as something that should correspond perfectly with the thing that it names. Mm. And so then we start uh, imagining that language, this gift, is uh, a way of 
uh, figuring out the world, of uh, studying it and learning uh, and representing it as if language was not a part of the world, as if it gets at the world from outside. So is it necessary that we use uh, written language, that we use language after we learn to read and write, that we use it in this representational way? No, I don't think it is necessary, but it no. becomes possible. It no. only becomes possible with writing. So to, to end our conversation, I will just make this one very important point. I have said a lot of curious things about the effect or the influence of the written word and especially. But am, so is what I am saying is that writing is bad, that writing is the cause of all these problems? No, no, I am not saying that writing is bad. No. I am a writer and I love books. You see some of my books here. I love to read. I love the world of literature. Yeah. I am not saying that writing is bad. I am saying that writing is a magic. And if we do not recognize that writing is a magic, then we tend to fall under its spell. And uh, in English, the word spell has this double meaning, you know, to, mm -hmm. but also it means to spell a word is just to arrange the letters in the right order. Mm -hmm. But originally these were one meaning because to, to learn to read and to write with the alphabet mm -hmm. was to cast a kind of spell upon yourself and upon the world. So I think it is only if we recognize the alphabet as a very particular and very powerful form of magic to, to, to bring uh, a, a rich new wonder yeah. and into the world. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Everyone is saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. We say also thank you, David. It was wonderful, wonderful to see you speak and to see you move and to see uh, very much. <laughs> All right. Thank it was you. a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for, for listening. And uh, yeah. We hope to bring you to Italy next year. Uh, speriamo di portare David uh, uh, in Italia il prossimo anno a insegnare. You, you would like to come, yes? I'd love to come. I'd love to oh. come to it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and of, hopefully by this time you will have your books translated also in Italian. Uh, it will take a bit longer than a year, I think. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Io l'ho invitato yeah. a venire in Italia, lui dice che piacerebbe molto uh, e... Um, sperando che i suoi libri poi saranno anche già tradotti e lui dice no no magari ci impiegheranno di più che un anno per tradurre i miei libri. Because it always takes uh, extra time to translate these works. Because yeah, I imagine, I imagine. Very poetic at the same time. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for participating and uh, uh, yeah, we just hope that uh, uh, this, what we did tonight with Inflow together with uh, David Abram, could have been of some inspire for you. And uh, uh, please uh, buy, buy his book. <laughs>